So in this video, I want to discuss egoism, specifically three kinds of egoism, Max Sternian, egoism, Ayn Randian, egoism, and Friedrich Nietzschean, egoism. And I think it's because there's only three kinds of philosophers that are egoists. I mean, I'm sure there's others. There's psychological egoism, which I don't know what philosopher came up with that, but it's that's one other school of egoism. I'm sure you can throw in some other philosophers that are kind of egoistic or that would help the self. So like, I don't know, maybe Epicurus, maybe Aristotle, Thomas Hobbes, but I don't know that I hardly know anything about Thomas Hobbes. Um, so yeah, I really want to talk about egoism and this is something that has been on my mind for quite a while now. And I feel like it's starting to come to a fruition. Like it's actually starting to become very prominent in my mind that it's, I feel like so much of my thinking, so much of my channel has led up to this point, this, this idea of what does it mean to be an egoist? What does it mean to be selfish for real? What does it actually mean to care about oneself? And again, the only philosophers that seem to actually take egoism seriously is Max Stirner, Ayn Rand, and Friedrich Nietzsche. I have no idea. It's, it's almost kind of scary how so few philosophers take an egoistic approach that they're just, they just don't care about the self. I mean, maybe even Descartes and David Hume talked about the self, but the, they, take the, they took a very s skeptical approach to it. And um, because I think they're important or... The, the reason why I'm so concerned with egoism is because I've played the altruist game. I've seen through the altruist game. I just, I don't want to be selfless anymore. I don't think selflessness is a good thing. It's not good to be selfless. It's not good to be um, an other, to care about the other. Like, you got to care about yourself because that's where all meaning comes from. That's the source of all meaning is yourself. Everything that you experience is from yourself. Anything that you care about is because you care about it. It's you care about something because of your own existence that makes you care about that something. Otherwise, how do you care about something if you're not here? All meaning extends from the self, I feel like. So... If the self is the most important thing, then a couple of questions arise, like, who am I, right? Who am I really, and what should I do? And I think this is so important because how do you be an egoist if you don't know who you are? How do you serve yourself if you don't know what the self is? It's, it's something that is very difficult to figure out and to understand. And so by taking the input of all of these philosophers, hopefully I can get to a better understanding and hopefully figure out like what sh I should do with my life. What should I, what should I do with myself after I figure out what the self is? But unfortunately, I don't think I can really answer this question this question of the self, because um, I'm just, I feel like I'm just getting started with philosophy. I feel like, I mean, I haven't read hardly, I mean, I've hardly read anything. I'm still reading Plato right now, and it's going to take me probably a couple more months before I get through Plato, and even then, I'm probably going to reread Plato. And I need to read Max Stirner. I need to read Friedrich Nietzsche. I have read Ayn Rand, but I feel like I need to reread Ayn Rand to truly understand 
or to get a better grasp of what she said, because I feel like my understanding of her is slipping. I feel like, um, I feel like my understanding of her isn't as rock solid as I thought, because I feel like there's holes in her ideas. Because when I started this channel, I was an objectivist. I considered myself an objectivist. Ayn Rand was my person. She was my my queen. She was the person I looked up to for the meaning of life. And you could say, oh, that's so embarrassing, or oh, that's so silly, but I got into Ayn Rand because she she helped me in a lot of ways. And the reason why I'm doing philosophy is because of her. The reason why I think she was a gateway for a, a really amazing path that I'm on right now. I think she she did a lot for me. So, but the reason why I became an objectivist and why I think egoism is so important and why Ayn Rand helped me see the importance of egoism was because I grew up as a pretty selfless person. I I was an altruist in a sense. So altruistic that it it made me unhappy. Like I was very unhappy. Um because in my family, one of my parents was an alcoholic and the other parent kind of just didn't seem to care or seem to think much about it. So, and the parent who was an alcoholic, they were an alcoholic because their parent, so my grandpa, was like a narcissist. This, I don't even know if he was a narcissist, but just, just so like egotistical in the bad sense, in, in a very wrong sense, uh, an evil sense, a distorted sense, like malignant selfishness or narcissism. It's, it's, it's a, it's like a fake selfishness. It's a, it's a fake egotism. That's what narcissism is because it makes you do these selfish things that are actually very destructive, that you think they're selfish, but they're actually destructive. And even drinking is destructive. Like so many people believe that doing drugs is selfish, that you're only thinking about yourself. And in a sense, you are only thinking about yourself, but you're not building yourself. You're not making yourself a better person. You're destroying the people around you and you're destroying yourself. Drinking, actually, if you think about it, if you, if you like on a day-to-day basis or if you frequent, frequently drink to the point that you black out, you're essentially committing suicide um, for the night. You're dying for the day and then you're being reborn. So drinking a lot is killing yourself. It's like slowly killing yourself because when you're drunk, you can't form memories. You can't make any good solid decisions. And when you wake up the next day, not only do you feel like garbage, but you don't even know what happened. So it's like that day of your life uh, didn't even exist. You weren't even there. You can't even form a memory of that day. So it's just, so when I was growing up, I, I grew up around that and I was a people pleaser and I was very worried about making this parent unhappy because this parent was either just totally deluded and not a a solid structure for me to depend on. Or when they weren't deluded, they were so bitter, so unhappy, and so, um, so incapable of functioning without alcohol that they, they were hypercritical and, and made me feel bad about myself and blamed me for all of their problems. Instead of dealing with their problems, they would blame me. So I became this like people pleaser. I became this very selfless, very nice, very codependent person who desperately tried to make this parent happy to keep myself alive. And because I grew up this way, I, um, 
became like a codependent. I I became friends um, in my early teenage years. I became friends with this friend. <laughs> Obviously, you don't become friends with just random people. You become friends with friends anyway. I became friends with this person and I sacrificed everything for this friendship. I always tried to make this person happy. And in a sense, I was kind of reliving that relationship all over again with another person. And it turned out that this friend that I had, uh, who clearly wasn't my friend, but was just this vampire sucking life out of me, uh, they told me they had borderline personality disorder. And I don't even know if they did. Um, I don't know if it was self-diagnosed. Even if it was self-diagnosed, I... I'm almost certain that they were a borderline or they, I thought they were a narcissist, to be honest. I thought, so, and narcissism and, and borderline isn't really that different. They're, they're essentially the same thing, really. And I've spent a lot of time watching videos on narcissism. I've watched YouTubers like Richard Grannon and Sam Vaknin to figure out what the hell was going on. Why am I around people that are narcissistic? And why do I have narcissistic problems of my own? Because, again, going back to the idea of egoism, which is what this video is about, it's so crazy to me that people think that to be egotistical means to do drugs or to abuse people around you because it's not in your best interest. There's nothing, right? Narcissists are not selfish. They're selfless. Like, you have to get that right. Like, you have to understand that there's, th that narcissists have a false self, that borderlines have identity problems, that they don't know who they are and they don't know how to um, maintain stability with their sense of identity. So, there's nothing selfish. There's nothing. E egoistic about these people and that's why they're so destructive and why they're so hard to be around and when you're around a narcissist a borderline or a psychopath you become an altruist to make these people happy to survive around these people they turn you into a, a meal because they're like vampires they 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 shape you into an obedient altruistic object so that they can suck the life out of you because they don't have a life of their own. And that's why Ayn Rand, to me, was so important and why she was so revolutionary and why she did so much good for me and ultimately why I left that friend, why I don't talk to that friend anymore. Um, of course, it's also the psychologists that I watched on YouTube and just learning about psychology and figuring out what the hell was going on. That was a big part of it, but um, I do think that Ayn Rand's philosophy really gave me a reason to figure out what it actually means to be selfish, because it's like, being a narcissist doesn't seem like the best, that doesn't seem like a possibility, but also being selfless and being altruistic and being charitable and having no boundaries and not sticking up for yourself, that doesn't seem like an option either. So who am I supposed to be? How am I supposed to be a good person if the goodness, if being moral means giving up yourself to something, if it means sacrificing to whatever? So that's why um, Ayn Rand was so important to me. And because she told me, you know, you need to have self-esteem. And how do you have self-esteem? Well, it's by being rational. It's by understanding the world and reality. And it's uh, being an individualist and reading her books and looking at her heroes. They are examples of how to live a quality life. So that was kind of... And I was totally into Ayn Rand, you know, when I turned 18. And ever since, I, I've always considered myself an objectivist until I started uploading YouTube videos. And for 
at least six months when I started my YouTube channel, I was pretty content with objectivism. Like, this is it. Like, I'm an objectivist. So we're done. Con- like, congratulations, you're an egoist. At least that's what I thought. But now I think that... I, I don't think Randian objectivism is the ultimate egoism. Because when you take into account Max Stirner and Friedrich Nietzsche, you get a totally different idea of what it means to be an egoist and being selfish. And I know it's taking it's this video is gonna be super long. I know I've talked a lot already, and I have even gotten to the meat of what I want to talk about, but I just feel like I need to explain this. Uh, I really want to write an essay on this. Like, I really want to read all of these philosophers. Like, I want to read all of, like, the important philosophers. I want to start with Plato and end with, like, the postmodernists and read everything in between. I have a book list on my blog if you're interested. But, uh, yeah, it's just taking me forever to just get through Plato And then after I read Plato, I want to read Aristotle, and it's like, I can't answer this question on egoism because I'm stuck reading Plato and Aristotle, right? Like, I want to read Friedrich Nietzsche, I want to read Max Stirner, and I want to reread Ayn Rand, but I just feel like I can't because so much of philosophy is built from Plato and Aristotle. So um, I have been reading Max Stirner, but I just, I kind of don't really understand his his main work ego and its own um it's just difficult to read i've been listening to a lot of summaries i tried to read friedrich nietzsche and then i just got bored because i wanted to read plato instead and on top of that friedrich nietzsche says a lot of things about plato he says a lot of things about immanuel kant so i just feel like i gotta i gotta start from the beginning and work my way through but uh, and then I'll be able to write my essay because I want to write an essay on this. I want to write an essay on egoism and what it means to be a real egoist. But so it's just going to take me forever to read all of these philosophers. But in order to read all of these philosophers, um, it's going to take me a lot of time. So instead, I'm just kind of making this video to put my views out there just to say what I need to say and just get it out there because I feel like it's out of fruition. I feel like I have a pretty good idea of what I think about this, even though I haven't actually read the philosophers fully. I've just seen summaries. So yeah, that's that. Just a short tangent right there. Going back to what I wanted to say, I considered myself an objectivist, right? And I recently discovered Max Stirner, and again, I've been really interested in narcissism and trying to figure out what narcissism means, and Sam Vaknin is a huge, a huge source, a huge intellectual powerhouse that I have used or, um, un- like, I've listened to so many of his videos. Like I use, I've watched so many of his videos to get an understanding of narcissism, narcissism, not only because he's philosophically interesting, but also because dealing with narcissism in my own family and just because the culture is more narcissistic and how, how selfless the culture is. Like it it thinks the culture thinks it's being selfish when it's actually being selfless. And so it's just interesting. And one of the biggest things about Sam Vaknin that he has um, talked about is this idea of nothingness. This idea that, right, because he's talked about uh, the self and meaning and, and purpose and narcissism and psychosis. And he developed this idea of nothingness about how to be happy. And for the, and he, he created a separate YouTube channel for this. Like, I totally think it's worth checking out because it's so like, you ever wonder why I hate life coaches and self-help gurus and why, I mean, I, who knows if you've watched my other videos, but in a lot, in the past couple of my videos, I've criticized a lot of self-help people. And it's because 
Sam Vagnon has helped me see that these people are, in a sense, they're teaching you to be narcissistic. They're teaching you to develop a false self and not a real self. They're teaching you, they're, they're, they're giving you hope for a, a life that you can't live. They're, they're, they're making you believe in something that isn't real so that they can take your money. That's basically, th- th- they're selling you a lie um, to take your money. And for the longest time, I, I didn't fully understand this nothingness concept until I discovered Max Stirner. And Max Stirner also has a very similar nothingness idea because Max Stirner is an egoist and he basically says that the self is nothing. And Sam Vaknin also says this, that you are nothing, that there is nothing. So the world is just this nothingness. And it's just, it's so interesting how Sam Vaknin's nothingness and Max Stirner's nothingness to me are kind of the same thing, or at least Max Stirner helped me fill in the gaps, helped me understand what Sam Vaknin was saying, because I didn't really understand. Because what is nothingness really? What does it really mean? It basically means that the, I, it's, it's kind of hard to explain, but it basically means that there is no such thing as like a con, there's no such thing as concepts. There's no such thing as beliefs or ideologies or nations or there's just nothing there. There's no such thing as a self. There's no such thing as, and I feel like for a lot of people listening to this and for the few people that even do listen to me, I I feel like no one will really care, but this is so important, at least to me. I think this is, this is groundbreaking to me and my understanding of life, but it, Sam Vaknin basically divided the world into, into three ways of looking into the world. There's psychosis where you have an internal object and you project that onto the world. So the, the, the most obvious and perfect example of this is God. So people invent God in their mind, and then they project it out into reality. And this God that they created gives them purpose. So psychosis is creativity. Psychosis is inventing things. It's inventing lies. It's inventing illusions. It's inventing a bunch of crap to give yourself meaning and purpose. And then the other way is narcissism. So it reverses this. Instead of creating something in your mind and pretending that it's real in the real world, narcissism kind of assumes that the self is the center of everything and the self gives everything purpose. So all of the, the externalities in the world can all be attributed to you. So like, um, the narcissist would be like, I'm God. Like, if there is a God, he would recognize me as someone special, right? So the narcissist would, I, I'm totally failing at explaining this, but it, narcissism is basically confusing out externalities with internalities. It's, it's, it's confusing reality with the self. It, it's like the self doesn't end. While for psychotics, people who believe in God, they're confusing the inner world with the outer world. And I guess you could say it's kind of the same thing, that narcissism and psychosis are kind of the same thing. And, you know, Sam Vaknin refers to other philosophers. He did refer to Jean-Paul Sartre. I think that's how you say his name, which I watched their, his videos and I got some of it. I I don't think I fully understood it. I'm going to read Jean-Paul Sartre eventually, but is it Jean-Paul Sartre or Jean-Paul Sartre? I don't know. He also talked Sam Vaknin also talked about Kierkegaard, and Kierkegaard tried to right cuz if you know anything about Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard really wanted to believe in God. 
and he said that in, right because the god delusion was right and in the 19th century the god delusion was kind of shattered you couldn't really believe in god anymore and so kierkegaard tried to tried to bring it back to life i guess and um kierkegaard combined psychosis and narcissism together so i haven't read kierkegaard but and 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 basically so what is nothingness right so like why are people psychotic and why are people narcissists it's because people lack a sense of meaning and purpose people um are they're basically lost they're um they they because if there is no such thing as a nation that you die for if there is no such thing as god if there is no such thing as a false self if you're a narcissist then you kind of collapse under reality like reality is so unbearable and so real that it it just we can't survive without this kind of this these delusions that we invent without these narratives that we we invent without these lies that we tell ourselves and Sam Vaknin kind of says that, well, with these lies that we make up, so much suffering is created. And this is why I think it's so similar to Max Stirner, because Max Stirner would say that psychosis and narcissism is just spooks. So, right, Max Stirner would say that God is just a spook. He wouldn't say it's psychotic. I mean, he probably would. I mean, I think he actually said we live in a madhouse. The entire world is just a madhouse. Everyone just believes in all of this crap. And we just need to label it as a spook. It's all, it's just, everything is just a spook. And the self is nothing. Because it's like, how are you supposed to know who you are? If if you don't have any kind of delusion or any kind of identity or any kind of, uh, it it's like um, I suck at explaining this. I know this in my head, like I know what I'm saying in my mind. It's just explaining it that is so difficult. That just it's like, oh, what am I trying to say? This is why I need to write an essay because, um so I can really like get this out in a very clear way for myself and potentially other people because this is so important but um because with these narratives and illusions we try to define ourselves in certain ways and when we define ourselves in certain ways it's suffering when we right when we invent a god and sacrifice to god we suffer in the process people die for their belief in God, when God doesn't actually exist. People die for their nation when the nation doesn't act actually exist, right? It, that's fascism. And people die for the poor or the, the, the middle, well, not the middle class, but they buy, they die for this ideology of, uh, of a utopia, which is communism, right? And people people are basically inventing these ideologies or these belief systems that take away from who they are and this is why max sterner is an egoist because he thinks that you should only live for yourself you should only like you are the source of meaning that you you are you are kind of what life, um, I, I, uh, I suck at explaining. Um, he, he basically, he basically says that all concepts are kind of, um, like when we call something a tree, um, I was watching Kane B, who's another YouTuber who explains this, but he gave this idea of a tree. And when we call something a tree, it has a kind of essence to it, right? We think a tree is like something like made of wood with branches and it grows leaves or whatever. But where does like, like is an acorn a tree? Um, if, if the tree dies, is it still a tree, right? Like 
If an acorn grows into a trunk and then the trunk grows branches and grows fruit, isn't the tree still what it is? Like it's still, it, it's always been the same thing, but it's been a bunch of different things at the same time. And you could say everything in the world is like this, that reality in, in a sense is, is a nothingness. There is no, no, there is no essence to anything, that nothing is what it is. That as soon as you call something something, as soon as you give something an identity, you're it's a spook, right? You're not looking at the reality for what it is. You're projecting a kind of illusion or a narrative onto reality, right? You're making something up, right? When you call a tree a tree, you're taking a slice of reality and 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 giving it meaning. You're imbuing it with meaning. You're 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 turning it into something when really the tree is nothing. The tree just, it, it's, it's an acorn. It's, it's whatever. And ultimately that th- this has to do with the self, right? When we define ourselves as something as like male or female or rich or poor or black or white, those are spooks because they take away from yourself, right? Cause you are a nothing, and because you're nothing, you can't be anything. And as soon as, as soon as you try to be something, you lose yourself. You, you, you die for this thing. You, you, you're no longer an ego anymore. Because what is narcissism? Narcissism is inventing a false self. And you sacrifice your true self for the image of this false self, right? You try to create this, this story or this narrative of who you are right? It's so it's totally a fiction. It's totally like, right? And narcissists, if you've ever met a narcissist and you see through their false self, you realize that they're nothing who they say they are. Their entire life is a lie. Their, their entire life is just nothing. But the narcissist invented this false self because they were so damaged as a child and, and the, their reality was so, just so awful their reality, right, they were so abused and so so damaged that the only way that they can cope with life is to invent a, a false persona and, and to act like this false persona is who they really are. And you could say people who are psychotic, people who believe in God. The reality of life is so painful, and I think Kierkegaard talks about this, right? With his idea of fear and anxiety. Like I haven't read his works, but I can already tell that like the reality is so harsh that we need to have faith and a belief in God, right? We need to believe that there's this daddy figure that's watching over us and cares about us and that our lives have purpose and it has meaning. But the problem with these stories is that we lose ourselves in the process. We lose who we are. And who we really are, we don't really know, right? Like, you, as soon as you try to define yourself, you're inventing a story. So you kind of just have to assume that you're nothing, that you're not really anything, that you're not trying to be something. You're just trying to be. You're not trying to aspire to anything. You're not trying to write a story or a narrative. You're just trying to be who you are. So that's the basic idea of Sternian egoism. And I think one of the biggest problems that I've noticed with objectivism, and one of the reasons why I don't consider myself an objectivist, is that objectivists, although they think they're being egoists, they are kind of falling for these spooks that Sam Vaknin and Stirner would say. So like, the idea of capitalism is a spook right? Because that's just another ideology. Like, objectivism itself is a spook, right? Like, you created a belief system, and you hold yourself to such a rigid standard. So you lose yourself to this belief system. So it's, it's, it's kind of ironic. Ironically, uh, an ideology of egoism is, is selfless, is non-egoistic, because, because you created a belief system. So, and rationality is another example. So like, 
Sterner would say that rationality is a spook. Why would you hold yourself? Why would you be subservient to rationality? Why do you, right? Because objectivists would say, what, what does it mean to be a human being? It means to be a rational animal. But then you're defining yourself. And now you're holding yourself to the standard of rationality. And if you do that, you're not an egoist anymore. You would lose yourself in the process. Now, Rand would say that, no, you're not. You, how can you be selfish without rationality, right? Because in order to in, in order to live, in order to make sense of your life, in order to have goals, to have aspirations, to live a life of quality and meaning, you need to have rationality. But again, Sterner would say, well, why do you have goals? Why are you trying to be rational? Why are you trying to be anything, right? And I, I feel like objectivists kind of, they just say you should be rationally self-interested, but it's like, well, how do I know if my values are rational, which is just one question, but why should I have any values? What values should I have? But but objectivists would say that, well, that Sterner is being s- silly, right? Like, because... Sterner says that you shouldn't carve the world, you shouldn't divide the world, you shouldn't label things, right? You shouldn't identify things because everything is nothingness, nothing is actually there. Because as soon as you try to identify things, right, you're, you're not living in reality anymore. But objectivists would say, like, you have to carve up the world, you have to identify things, you, ha- you have to identify yourself. It's the only way to make any progress. It's the only way to make sense of anything. Like it doesn't make, how can you live your life if you're not rational, right? An objectivist would say that to the degree that you are rational, the more quality and better your life will be. Because, right, if you're a human being, you, first of all, if you want to survive as a human being, if you want to flourish as a human being, you need in order to understand, you, there's just so many things you need to understand, right? Like, first of all, you need to Id- identify yourself. Well, I'm a human being that needs food, water. What else does this mean? This also means I need to know about my environment. I need to be able to identify things so that I know what food to eat. And you could even expand it fur- further where it's like, well, if I want to live a life that's that doesn't suck, maybe I should aspire to higher things than just food. So, right, like I can't just eat food. And and that's why objectivists believe in capitalism, because it's like, this is a very logical ideology to believe in, because, well, what's a system that recognizes the rights, the individual rights of all egoists? Well, it's capitalism, right? We can't have anarchy, right? Because Max Stirner is considered by many to be an anarchist. But if you have anarchy, then what happens when a criminal decides to steal your stuff, right? Like, how do you own something and how do you build a life if you um, uh, if you don't have property rights? But Sterner would say property rights are, are a, a lie. You know, they don't actually exist. And if you are an egoist, why should you... And maybe I'm distorting Max Stirner. Like, again, I need to really read these people and write an essay on this. But it, it's kind of like, um, are, if, if, you, if you commit too much to capitalism, are you sure you're being an egoist? Are you sure you're not falling for a spook like everybody else? Right? Like, that's the main thing that Stirner would say. And... Sam Vaknin would say is that you really shouldn't follow an ideology because you're kind you're going to lose yourself in the process and you know maybe you know the other thing is that like even so I guess the other thing is like one thing that I've noticed about being an objectivist is that I would hold myself to a very high and rigid standard of trying to be a rational person. 
And I think a lot of objectivists, I feel like objectivism and objectivists are kind of dishonest because they basically say that you should pursue your rational self-interest and that's that. But how can you be a rational person 100% of the time? Like, isn't it impossible to be rational? And don't you think it's it's kind of um, selfless to be rational? When you hold your... Like, what's wrong with believing in something that's irrational on some level? Uh, what's wrong with... Because it's like if you if you hold yourself to such a high standard of trying to be rational all the time, which is impossible for a human being, then you're going to fail to live up to the objectivist values, which means you're you're not right. You're trying to be something that you're not right. You're trying to identify as something, which goes against what it means to be an egoist for Sterner, where you're trying to be nothing, right? You're not trying to be anything. You're not trying to be a rational person. You should just be rational um, to kind of help you. Or, or like you shouldn't even identify it. You shouldn't even say that I am a rational person. You should just be rational when it helps you. But I, I guess like an objectivist would be like, well, that's stupid because if you're not rational as much as you can, then you can do a lot of really horrible things. Like, if you're like if if you're irrational and you believe that uh you can grow food by praying to god you're not going to live or you're going to die so you kind of have to live up to that rational standard right you can't just believe whatever you want you can't just follow your feelings you have to be rational about it if you want to survive. So, but the thing is, though, there there is a really strong commonality between Rand and Sterner, and it's this idea that the nation is a spook, like society is a spook, humanity is a spook, because it's like, where do I fit in to society? Because Ayn Rand and Margaret Thatcher, who in a way are very, very similar, they're both like iron ladies, like, as a joke, I think of Ayn Rand as Iron Rand, and Margaret Thatcher is seen as the Iron Lady because they're just, you know, they're very solid, you know, rational women, no nonsense, and they're, you know, individualistic. And so, and they both said that society doesn't exist because when you eat food, food goes into your stomach. It doesn't go into society's stomach. When another person eats food, that food doesn't drop into your stomach, it drops into their stomach. So there is no such thing as a collective because we don't share stomachs, we don't share minds, we don't share ideas. We can we can only relate to each other, but we can't combine into the super organism, right? And if you say there is a super organism, like the nation or this group of people, like whatever... It's a spook, as Sterner would say. So that's what they have in common. And so, and when I say objectivists, like a lot of objectivists accuse a lot of, right? When when objectivists say that you're being irrational, it's because of these collectivist ideas. It's because of these altruistic spooks. So in a sense, when I actually think that Rand and Sterner fundamentally agree on rationality in the sense that I believe that the nothingness idea and not committing to any spooks is rationality. Like, it's a rationality automatically that it doesn't even need to be labeled. Um, Like, you are being rational when you don't follow spooks. And so when you look at Rand, who says that you should be rational, you could just say, well, she's just saying nothingness in a sense. Now, of course, if she was here, she'd be like, no, there isn't a a nothingness, right? There's a, I don't know. I feel like objectivists kind of have this naive realism or this like, they don't really question what the self is. And on my channel, I've made videos of this where I've talked about, I have one video on 
identity and ideology. Um, I have another video on um, I have one video where where I talked about authenticity because when when I was like trying to be an objectivist and when I was thinking about my values and thinking about like who I was, because, Again, when I started this channel, I really thought I was an objectivist and I was welcomed in some objectivist circles. And when I started debating these objectivists, not only were they not being rational to a really rational degree, like they were falling for the objectivist spook. Like they were committing so much to an ideology of objectivism that it they weren't even being egoistic anymore, even though objectivism is an egoistic philosophy. And they also weren't recognizing the limits of rationality, that you can't be rational all the time. And I feel like, I don't know if if Stirner said that rationality has a limit, but I know that Sam Vaknin did. I know that Sam Vaknin said that even if you aspire to nothingness, right, you can't aspire to nothingness, right? The whole point Right, because as soon as you aspire to nothingness, you're you're creating an identity out of it, right? You're creating a belief system out of it, right? Which defeats it, right? You're you're not trying to be a nothing. It's like a passive acceptance of nothingness, right? And it and and it's kind of the same in the sense that when you're um, it's not that you you. It's not that, like, oh, I, I lost my train of thought. Darn it. I was going to say something important, but whatever. So, anyway, so that's kind of, like, the debate between Rand and Sterner, where um, I'm trying to, like, figure out, oh, yeah, I was talking about objectivism and, like, identity, because I was, like, because I just felt like reason is limited, and because reason is limited, right? Because reason to me is like a tool. It's like a giant machine that you put in a bunch of raw data and it spits out answers. And the problem that I have with reason is, okay, what raw data should you put into the machine? That's the first problem. Like you can't use reason to figure out what things to reason about, right? It's like an infinite regress. Like this is like the main problem that I have where it's like, how do you know what to be rational about when you don't even know what the rational, like, how can you perform rationality properly if you can't even, it, it, it's like, you have a nearly infinite amount of science, science experiments to do, but how do you perform a science experiment to figure out the right science experiment? I mean, you can't, it's impossible. So reason is limited in, in some capacity, like it takes too long to actually use it. So, and, and objectivists kind of just ignore that. And so when you're trying to figure out your values and your authentic self, I just feel like, well, how do you know who you are, right? Like, again, like I just think Stirner is right about this, that the, that, that the self is kind of like this nothingness and that whatever values you have that your whatever morals and values you have, they're kind of just these, they're, they're, they're not real values, but, um, but the, the problem is with all of this, with this nothingness idea is that, well, first of all, Ayn Rand doesn't even recognize the nothingness of the self. She doesn't even recognize existentialism. Like she doesn't, I don't think she seems to recognize um, humans' desire for purpose and meaning and how we make stuff up. She seems to, she's, the, she's like the person that, although it's like, it's super admirable, like her philosophy has, is much better than all of the other spooks. She kind of falls for the illusion like everyone else. She falls for the ghost. And she can't see that you're falling for a ghost. Like, especially when you read her novels and you, and you read about her characters, right? 
Her characters are so idealistic and they're so perfect and they're so like they're so rational and they're so logical and it's like this is not within any real human being's grasp to like no one can be like her characters i like her characters are just, they're too good right they're 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 just they're just not real and it it's just unhelpful to aspire to be like these characters because you're just you're going to fail to be like these characters i i, I even think i can't remember where i read this Maybe this was a lie because there's so many negative things written about Ayn Rand because I don't know why people hate Ayn Rand so much, honestly, but whatever. But I do remember reading like an article or something where Ayn Rand felt very sad that she couldn't be like John Galt, which is one of her like her heroic characters. Like she felt ashamed and bad about herself because she wasn't living up to this idealistic character that she invented, right? So it's like she's falling for a spook. Why are you trying to, why are you comparing yourself to this character? Why, right? Like, does this really make you happy? And again, going back to this idea of spooks, um, well, I've, why would I, going back, I've been talking about spooks. What am, what am I doing? Anyway, I, um, so Ayn Rand seems to be falling for this illusion. Now, Friedrich Nietzsche comes in, and I think Nietzsche is important here, and I, I need to read Nietzsche. I, I've only, I just hear a lot of things about Nietzsche. I don't think I've actually ever, like, well, I've seen some documentaries. I, I have some good summaries of Nietzsche and, and his ideas, but Nietzsche basically sees that human beings need meaning and they need purpose. And he saw it like a mile away, right? So he wrote in the 19th century, right? And in the 19th century, there was the Industrial Revolution. God was dying. Kierkegaard wrote before Nietzsche and Kierkegaard was like dealing with this existent, right? You could say Kierkegaard was like the first existentialist, I think. He was like the father of existentialism. And Nietzsche... I probably read Kierkegaard, I think, but he's basically, Nietzsche basically saw God is dying. Humanity's need for purpose and meaning is going away. Like we're screwed, right? And something is going to replace God and it's going to be much more bloody, much more evil, much more uh, awful, right? And I, I I watched Jordan uh, Jordan Peterson video and he said that like Nietzsche predicted that the 20th century would right millions of people would die because God is dead right so when that meaning is gone people are going to invent new ideologies they're going to invent new spooks like even Max Stirner I mean Max Stirner and Nietzsche I mean these people are geniuses like I mean I mean because Max Stirner also wrote in the 19th century. It's like these people could see so far into the future. They could see what humanity's doom. Like they could see like this is a spook, right? Like this, this is, um, I, it's kind of funny to say spook. This is a spook. That's a spook. There's like so many memes about it and about Stirner, you know, but, um, like they could see like the danger of what's going to happen, right? When this meaning goes away, when this structure, when this godly father figure goes away, what's going to happen to humans, right? They're, and they turn to fascism, they turn to communism, they turn to all of these crazy ideologies, all of these ridiculous beliefs and right? Millions of people were killed, right? Very egoless, right? The death of ourselves, the death of human life, because they sacrifice their lives to, to, to their nations, to these ideologies out of the, des out of the need for meaning. And so I feel like Nietzsche kind of recognizes that, um, Nietzsche recognizes that humans do need meaning and we need to believe in something that, you know, 
I, I, a lot, I think a lot of people think that Nietzsche is a nihilist, but he's not. And, you know, Nietzsche's idea of egoism is, so Nietzsche believes in like this ubermensch idea and this will to power. And, you know, before you talk about Nietzsche, you kind of have to talk about Schopenhauer. And Schopenhauer basically believed that there was this will, right? That all human, that all living things had like this will, and I guess you could say this is it's in the nothingness, right? Like, what is the self? It's a nothingness. And I guess you could replace the nothingness with the will. And Schopenhauer basically said that all, all human, all living things strive for, right? They all have this irrational will. Like, you could almost say that the self is kind of this... I mean, it's a nothing, right? But it's also kind of this irrational, like all of our desires are kind of just irrational, like they're pointless, right? Like it's it's self-defeating. Like you, I, maybe Schopenhauer was right about all of this. Like life is empty. Life sucks. Life is suffering. That's all life is. And we have this will that it irrationally wants to keep doing things, right? And so... Right, Ayn Rand would say, well, you should be rational to um, pursue or to help your will, right? Or something like that. But fundamentally, the self is irrational. That to live is irrational and pointless and doesn't go anywhere. Um, and... Um, Let's see, there was another thing I wanted to say. But yeah, okay, so Nietzsche took a lot from Schopenhauer. And Schopenhauer had this kind of like, you should just give up on life. It doesn't make any sense, right? It's it's irrational. And Nietzsche rejected that and went the opposite direction, right? Because at first in his career, he agreed with Schopenhauer. But then he's like, no, we, we should fight for something that you know, Nietzsche expanded on it with the will to power. So everything is trying to gain power, whatever that might be. And, you know, and Nietzsche talked about this idea of the ubermensch. And with Nietzsche, I also get this idea of there's like the ubermensch, there's like the powerful people, and then there's the weak people, there's the sheep, there's the idiots, right? And the sheep should be sacrificed or used for for the ubermensch's purposes that he, the ubermensch are what matter this superior human being this this human being between the god and the average is the ubermensch and the ubermensch is like the next phase in humanity and i feel like this could be another spook I think, and the other thing is that Ayn Rand and Stirner would both attack Nietzsche out of this sense of, like, why do you need to be an ubermensch? Or, like, Rand would say that, well, that's just unfair, okay? I Rand believes in win-win relationships, right? She believes in capitalism. She doesn't believe that you need to sacrifice people for the ubermensch. And on top of that, she would also say that this ubermensch idea right that is kind of um it's kind of this humanity it's it's about humanity right it's about it's about the progression of humanity it's not about progression of the individual but the progression of the humanity so i would almost say that nietzsche isn't even an egoist he is just another kind of collectivist but his collectivism is serving few individuals and these individuals are not, these individuals pursue their own values and their own will to power, whatever that is. And they, and, you know, Rand would also say that Nietzsche is just irrational because Schopenhauer is irrational. Kant is irrational. Kant, Kant it, to me, is kind of just a very sophisticated form of Platonism because Plato believed in the perfect forms, right? And, you know, the perfect forms and heaven 
and God are kind of all the same thing to me. And Kant was this very religious man. And when he saw that religion was fading, Kant was just like, well, reason doesn't actually know what can't actually get to the truth. Right. So I feel like, I feel like if you replace Plato's perfect forms with the numeral world, it's, it's just Platonism all over again. And Rand was more Aristotelian, right? She didn't believe in any of that. So she would say Kant is just irrational. Kant is just, uh, right? And Schopenhauer took from Kant and then Nietzsche took from Schopenhauer. So Rand would just say, you're being irrational, right? Like this will to power, like this, this drive, this force, this metaphysical force, like it's just a bunch of nonsense, right? It just doesn't make any... She would just say that's not real. That doesn't make any sense. And you need reason to serve yourself. You can't just do things out of this intuition or this will. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like Nietzsche really isn't that much of an egoist when you think about it. And um, he's just... Yeah, his Ubermensch idea is sacrificial. You're dying for something that it, it's a spook, really. It's just it's the the Ubermensch idea. Just I, it's just not real. I think so. But I do think that Nietzsche recognized that we need meaning and purpose. And in my last video, I did talk about. Um, finding meaning in monumental creativity. That was kind of, uh, that's my own spook that I invented. So I didn't invent God. I didn't invent a false self. I invented this idea of building a body of work. That's my meaning and purpose. That's what I think will give me meaning. And I feel like Nietzsche recognized that, well, there's value in sacrifice and hard work. There's value in pain. There's value in suffering. There's value in working towards something higher and strong, standing strong in this, this, this path that you set out on. Maybe I'm totally distorting Nietzsche, but I think that because I feel like this nothingness idea is too hard. Like, who can right? Because nothingness almost sounds like when you think of um, Stirner and Sam Vaknin who talk about nothingness, it's very Eastern, right? It's an Eastern belief. It's this idea that the self isn't really here and the universe is all connected in the sense that you can't divide the universe because when you divide it, you give it identity. And when you give things identity, then you're creating spooks out of them. So everything is kind of all connected and you should just crush your desires. You should just dispel with your desires because when you act on your desires, it gives you hope. It gives you a sense of, right? Like you think you have purpose and in a sense, you're, you're, um, you're, right? It's self-defeating, right? Like, I, I feel like Schopenhauer is kind of similar in the sense that you should just give up on all desire because it's self-defeating. And that's why Schopenhauer was so, so amazed by the Eastern beliefs because they agreed with him. It's like, you should just, you should just give up. You, you just shouldn't ask for anything. You just shouldn't, um, aspire towards anything because it gives you hope it gives you purpose that will just end nowhere like because i feel like the biggest problem with all of this with all of these beliefs and all of these ideologies is not only do they give you false hope and so you're just going towards something that will just die anyway but you're um you're not being your true self i guess you could say you're you're giving up yourself towards something that's not really true right and you're just, um, people are, I'm sorry, this is so rambly. It's just, it's so hard to say all of this because there's so much to say. And I'm just, I'm trying to say everything at once when I just need to take it linearly. But, um, 
uh, let's see. So, so I feel like nothingness is kind of turning your back on everything, turning your back on the world, turning your back on desire, turning your back on hope, turning back on ideals and visions and creating something like you should just give up on all of it because you'll just end up unhappy. You'll just give up one spook for another. You'll just replace one ideology with the next. Like you're just, you're like this monkey who's constantly trying to satisfy themselves and never satisfying themselves. So just give up. Stop trying to be something that you're never going to be. Stop trying because you see this, especially um, in the postmodern world that we live in, right? You see people who really want to be rich. And this is one of the main criticisms that Sam Vaknin gives of, you know, in his words, self-styled experts, right? Because these are people who are selling you a lie to take your money. Not only are they taking your money, but they're giving you hope for something that's just never going to happen, right? Because these gurus tell you that you can be rich. They tell you that you can be the top lobster, right? You can be, right? Jordan Peterson says, don't lie. Just move something heavy. Just clean your room and your life will be amazing. Your life will matter. Um, pick whatever guru you want. Pick whatever ideology you want. Like all of these people, all of these narcissistic psychopaths, right? The, the, the people at the top of the religion, the people who, um, the people who own the, the conservative movement or the liberal movement or communism or fascism, right? Like Hitler and Nazism or Stalin and communism or whatever it is, whatever cult it is, these people are selling you a lie. They give you meaning. They give you purpose. They make you feel like something matters in the world. They make you feel like you're on the path towards something great when actually there's nothing there that you're just going to be unhappy and you'll probably either you'll die in the process you'll lose your life because these people are or you'll lose all your money and you know these psychopaths these these people who are at the top whatever they might be who um right they're just they they just want right they're the narcissist right so you're the you're the psychotic who buys into the psychosis that they make up and they're the narcissist and they think that they should be able to have whatever they want and they they want attention and adulation and so they make up some nonsense so that you can tell them how great they are so you see how 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 selfless everyone is how altruistic everyone is how how these psychopaths and these narcissists are, they think that they find meaning when people pay attention to them. And these people think they find meaning when they buy into the illusions and the spooks that the, the psychopaths and the narcissists make up. And so the world is just crazy. You see all of this crazy stuff. As Max Stirner says, we live in a madhouse. We, we are crazy people. And so... And so it's like, you should just give up. But also it's like, what are you supposed to do when there's nothing there, right? And this is why it's kind of like an existential crisis because it's like, you have no meaning, you have no purpose. You don't know who you are. You can't really define yourself as anything. And there's two sides to this. When you choose nothingness, you're free. You can be anything you want. You don't have to be anything. You don't have to sacrifice for anything. You don't have to buy into anything. You can just enjoy yourself however you want. But the price you pay for that with this ultimate freedom is that you have no purpose and you have no meaning. It's like you're floating in the void. It feels like, you know, again, it's nothingness. Nothing matters. It feels right. Like for Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard would say that, no, we have to believe in God, you know, or um, 
right? People can't accept this. Like they don't want the freedom. Like freedom is paralyzing. Freedom is scary. It's scary to be free. It's scary to be, um, to have all the choices in the world. It's scary to not have an identity, right? Because people want to be something. They want to have something. They want reality to be a certain way. They don't want freedom, right? Which is why I think it's why anarchism will never happen or libertarianism will never happen because people need to believe in like the state. They need to believe in some kind of authoritarianism because it's just too much. So, so it's like, what do you do? You know, like I, cause I feel like I'm stuck in the middle. I feel like I can't choose nothingness because not only if you choose nothingness, you're, it's self-defeating anyway, because, uh, you're trying to be something when the whole point of nothingness is not to be, but also I want purpose. I want to feel like I have a purpose. I need to feel like I have an identity. And I guess another way of looking about it as like, if you are an egoist who just wants to enjoy their life, and you don't want to take advantage of other people. You don't want to live in the madhouse. You want to just be a normal human. What do you do? And when I was learning about Max Stirner, uh, I was also learning about Epicurus. And it's kind of interesting, or maybe it was a coincidence, but Epicurus and Max Stirner seem very much, they seem very similar because they both had this idea of spooks. Like, they both ha- had this, like, opposition to fear. Like, you shouldn't be afraid of something that doesn't exist, right? Because what, what was Epicurus's main thing? Well, he was all about pleasure and pain. And I feel like that's, th- that's like, the bare minimum. Like, well, not the bare. Like, that's, that's the ground for everything. That if you really want to judge what life is about, it's not... It's not how you divide it. It's not how you understand it. It's not what you say it is. It's like, do you feel pain or pleasure, right? Like, I feel like that's the the most basic, that's the best way to live an egoistic life. Because the more pleasure you have, the better your life is, regardless of whatever identity you have. If you have pleasure, it's good. If you have pain, it's bad. So the question is, how do you maximize pleasure and avoid pain? And I feel like Epicurus answered this question by saying, in a similar way to Max Stirner, where it's like, well, don't believe in the spooks. I've, I've said spooks literally, well, not literally, but oh, it felt like a thousand times, but right? Because Epicurus was like the first one to be like, um, don't believe in the gods. Like he just did not want to believe in myths or fairy tales. He was very much, uh, he was very matter of a fact, right? He was very, because it creates fear for people. It, it, it's, which is kind of weird because I just thought of this, but because it's like people invent these narratives and stories and they invent God to give them peace, right? To give them purpose, But then, but then Epicurus is saying, well, when you don't believe in God, then you're at peace, right? Like, what do you need meaning for? It's almost like Epicurus is saying that you don't need meaning, that you don't need narratives because the narratives make things actually worse than you think. Maybe they, they actually, um, they actually make you more afraid than you should be. So, I don't know, that's kind of interesting. Like, do you really need meaning? I think that's really interesting. So, for the final part of this video, I know this has been super long, and I talk way too long and whatever, but this is honestly for my own enjoyment. I... I want to be able to go back and listen to this 
after I've done all of my research and read all of the philosophy, because I'm crazy and I just really want to know the answer to this. But once I've read all of this, I want to see like if I still think the same or if my concept or understanding of this will have changed. But the the last thing I want to end with is like maybe because I feel like it's kind of just really extreme, right? Like with Epicurus, he seems to think like pursue pleasure as much as you want, but he ends up starting to realize that, well, all pleasures just aren't really worth it. That, yeah, drinking is really great and it's really fun, but every time you drink too much, you just feel like crap anyway. So you should just stop drinking. So I almost see it as like, you should desire things and enjoy things, but as soon as they create more pain than pleasure, then cut them out. And so that's kind of like, so when I think about my idea of egoism or like how to be an egoist, I I think about it as riding the egoist wave. So ride the wave. What, 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 what are your desires that will bring you the most pleasure with not that much pain. What are, and those desires can include spooks, right? So what are spooks that are within your grasp that won't really cause that much pain? That if you believed in them, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. Because a part of me thinks that maybe the belief in God isn't such a bad thing if you don't let it like destroy your life, if you don't, for example, if you're at the doctor's office and the doctor diagnoses you with cancer and your belief in God says, well, God, it was God's will to have me get cancer. And if he wants me to live, then my cancer will go away. So I will put my life in the hands of God. To me, I think you're just being dumb, right? You're, you're letting this narrative, you're letting this spook destroy your life. And I would also say that the belief in God is actually creating more fear than purpose. That I actually think a lot of religious people, as Epicurus would say, are under more fear and stress because of their belief in hell that you know, it would just be a lot better for them if they just didn't believe in hell and if they just faced reality that if they did get cancer, they should be strong and accept the diagnosis and do what they can to get treatment for it instead of just turning their back on it and going into God, you know. So ultimately, I think as an egoist, you shouldn't be religious, I guess. And this goes like for everything in your life. Like you just have to think about all of the narratives. Like, like your family is a narrative. Your family is, um, right? Like it's not really right. The whole concept of parents and the concept of sibling and the, and this idea that your family has more meaning than other people because you're relatives, that's all kind of a spook. But the belief in family isn't such a bad thing. Like, just be aware of it. Just be aware that this isn't actually real. But playing along with it isn't such a bad idea, actually. Like, to love your parents and to treat your parents as parents is actually pretty good. To be committed to your family isn't such a bad thing as an egoist. Just don't die for your family, right? Just don't take it too far. Don't think that like, don't think that your family comes before your, your ego, yourself, right? I I would call that blood racism where, um, you, you give your family priority just because they're your relatives for the same reason that racists, uh, give, people of their own race priority and they see them as better simply because they share the same skin color and they hate people with different skin colors, right? That's a that's a spook that doesn't help anyone, right? Racism should be forgotten, right? We should just let go of that. Race is just a joke that doesn't exist. 
That's not a real thing. People who keep talking about race are just making it worse for everyone. And then if we talk about, um, I feel like a big thing going on in, in the in the culture today is women, right? Well, not women, transgenderism and what is a woman? What is a woman, right? That's like the thing going around. And transgenderism is like a really hot topic right now. And I think gender roles are a spook. They're, they're, con- they're constructions, right? Gender is a construction. But I also think it's a construction that kind of serves its value. Um, it helps people connect and relate to one another. But I also think that I feel like people take their gender way too seriously on the left and the right. People on the left take their gender so seriously, right? They lose their ego, right? Again, gender to me is a spook. As Sterner would say, where these people somehow, for some weird reason, they have this desire, they have this belief that they are the opposite sex, and they think that they'll be happy if they just have surgery to mo- to modify their body to look like the, under, the, the other sex. Sorry, that was kind of a mouthful. Th- these people basically think they'll be happy if they look like the other gender right? So it's like, this desire to me is this, I don't think this will really make you happy. And again, you're trying to be something when you're more than your gender. Like Sterner would say you're nothing. Rand would say, or at least the 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 kind of egoist, the Randian egoism, when I was an objectivist, I would always say that the individual is more than whatever you define it as. So like, you could say I'm white, you could say I'm gay, you could say I'm a furry, you could say I'm um, male. But I'm more than all of those things. I'm not just a male. I'm not just white. I'm not just a furry. I am Casper. And Sterner would say that the only the only way to define yourself is just with your name. And you know, Rand, again, Rand would just say that you're not, you're not what your group is, right? You're not a white person. You're not a, a, a male. You're not, you're an individual and you're a self-made soul and you are who you are based on your choices and what you choose to do. And in a similar way, Sterner says the same thing in the sense that you're constantly dying and being reborn, like I just died and was reborn. Like every second of every day, I'm in a constant state of death and rebirth because th- there is no real solid identity. And so that's what's really important about this egoism thing. Whether you believe in nothingness or you're just a standard egoist, you, I, I kind of see identities and desires as kind of like you're wearing, you're trying them on for size, like they're clothes. So, and and you should just act on these desires and you should have these identities to the degree that they help you in your life, to the degree that, you know, this is pretty good. This isn't such a big deal, um, right? Like if it's summer, wear, you know, just wear shorts and a t-shirt. Why would you wear a coat? And if it's winter, wear a coat. Don't wear don't wear shorts. And I feel like it's the same with your ego and your identity. Identify with things that just make sense, that will make your life better, that will give you more pleasure and not give you pain. Um, be a capitalist, not because you actually are a capitalist. And I think actually Sterner says this. Um, I could be wrong, but it's like, be a capitalist because hey, property rights is really great and it helps me do the things that I feel like I want to do. But don't be a capitalist to the degree that uh, you lose yourself in the process. And 
like another thing in my last video, I talked about monumental creativity and how I could give myself meaning and purpose and, and give my, myself a, a sense of identity by creating a, a large body of work. And I think that this isn't a bad idea. I think this is fine. I think this is meaningful. I think this is a wonderful desire. I think it will make me a better person. It's fun. It's interesting. It's great to be a creative person and to find meaning in creating art and creating a body of work in general. But don't sacrifice your life to this body of work. Don't let it take control over your life. Don't let it become your identity. Let it be an extension or a, uh, let it be a, in addition to our, to your identity, but don't let it become your identity because these things can be taken away from you, right? You, you have to keep in mind that everything is right. Cause the self is nothing, right? And the self, it can't really be anything. So when you try on an identity, right? Like when you wear clothes, Sure, they become a part of you. When you wear a mask, it becomes a part of your face. And if you wear a mask long enough, you can almost confuse the mask for your actual face. But you kind of always have to keep in mind that these identities and these desires and these these narratives that you tell yourself, you tell them to the degree that they help you. And then you let them go when they don't help you. And I think I said this earlier in the video, but I didn't finish explaining this, but I call this riding the egoist wave. Just ride the wave of whatever desires help you. And if the desire goes against the wave, right? Like you're right, you're going down a river, right? You're just going with the flow and just follow the river. And uh, sometimes you'll come into a fork in the road and you have a choice. It's like, do you want to go left or right? If you want to go right, then go right. This is the path that you want to choose, that you like. But don't swim against the current. Don't try to swim up the river, okay? Just flow into the ocean. And it's the same way with, like, riding a wave. Don't fight against the wave. Surf the wave, right? And if this wave says, you know, start a business because you you're in a really good position to start a business, you have a lot of money, and you have this really great idea, start the business. It'll give you meaning, it will give you purpose, but if you're not placing like your life, it, it, it's not going to make or break your life, you know? It, it's the same with being transgender. I feel like for some people, being transgender is a great idea. It's, it's like, yeah, just like, I feel like for ContraPoints, that was a really great wave for her that she could ride because um, it plays into the culture, the cultural narrative, and the, and the fad of changing your gender. Um, it probably made her more popular and made her more interesting. She probably felt more feminine than masculine, so that would help with a lot of her gender dysphoria, whether it's real or not. And so it was just a very, I feel like she rode the wave of just being transgender. But I feel like a lot of people, a lot of young people especially, are being told that they need to transition when they really don't. Like it's against their current, like they're being lied to. There are psychopathic narcissists who are infusing in your mind and telling you that you need to change your gender because you'll be happier, right? They're, 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 They're selling you this nonsense so they can take money from you. So surgeons can perform surgery on you. So you can buy hormones. So you can uh, play into the culture, right? That there's a lot of money to be made here by making you think you need to change your gender. A lot of money. And so if you're in a position where changing your gender won't be beneficial, and I feel like for most people it won't be because you sterilize yourself in the process, you, um, right? You, you don't really become the gender that you want. And in a sense, you're, you're going against the wave, right? This is a desire that you shouldn't act on. This is a desire that you should let go of. This is not in the cards for you. It's not in the cards for you to change your gender. 
So let go of it. Find something else. Find other strengths. Find your strengths. Notice your weaknesses and and work on use her strengths to your ability, right? Um, like again, um, people want to get rich, right? People want to become billionaires. They want to be the top lobster, right? They want to be, they want to be winners, right? They want to be cool and famous and powerful. But the truth is, ninety nine percent of people are not in the position to be famous. And so, if you tr- if you try to be famous. If you spend your life trying to be famous, you are you are swimming against the current. You are trying to go against the wave, and this wave is going to overpower you, and it's going to crush you. And there are people who are going to lie to you and make money off of you by telling you what you want to hear by playing into your delusion. So you should let go of this desire. You should let go of this desire to be a billionaire. You should let go of this desire to be famous, right? Find something else that's more meaningful. Um, that's, that's kind of the main thing with egoism. And you, this could go on and on and on, whatever it is. Like a lot of older people can't accept that they're getting old. And so they get plastic surgery and they do this with their hair and they do that. And it's like, just age with grace. You're old, accept it. Stop trying, right? Don't spend all of this money to make yourself look more youthful because you're not going to be any more youthful. You're, you are who you are in a sense, like, right? Like this identity of being young is beyond you. You can't be a young person anymore. You're an old person and you're not going to be an old person forever. You're going to be dead, right? Because the whole, being an ego, is to not be anything. It's in a constant state of flux and change. And so again, you have to kind of just ride the wave. You kind of just have to choose identities that work for you and let them go when they don't serve you anymore. I think that's the essence of egoism. That's what I, that's what I think it means to be an egoist. And it's difficult It's hard because sometimes you have desires and identities that you really want, that you buy into, that you think you can have, and you think that once you get them, you'll be happy. And once you get there, you realize, oh, I'm not actually happy. And so you find other identities and you kind of just need to realize that you should just enjoy your life. Just take on identities as they come, look for challenges look for meaning and purpose, but don't think that when you find a meaning and purpose that your life will be perfect, that everything will be fine, that, that it's all going to end, that, that like you're going to find a destination, that things are going to matter because they won't, right? You kind of just have to roll with it and, and take, Take life as it comes. And that... (coughs) Oh, (coughs) Oh, shoot. (laughs) I've been talking forever. This is such a long video. This is ridiculous. I, um... Yeah, but this was a really important video for me. I think this is probably one of... (laughs) Ironically, this is one of the most meaningful videos I've ever made. And again, I'm not really, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, that's it for this video. Thank you for listening. Um, I hope you have a better understanding of egoism. I know I did, and this was just really fun to think about and to talk about, and I will see you later.